Hello and welcome to Bloomsbury Festival 2020. Thank you so much for joining us for this special screening of The Betrayed Girls, presented by the Sexual Harms and Medical Encounters team at Birkbeck. This event will be followed by a panel discussion. The Betrayed Girls is about the exploitation of young girls in Rochdale. Rochdale was not an isolated event. Thousands of young children are systematically abused across Britain. On the film's broadcast in 20, 2017, the press reviews focused on the perpetrators' brutal treatment of the young women and on the failure of agencies like the police and the social services to act. They ignored public denial of the prevalence of sexual violence against children. This event brings together academics, activists and practitioners to explore the visions of the future in which we can better respond to what children tell us and to protect them. The discussion will address our emotional responses to child sex sexual abuse and exploitation and how that affects our behavior as citizens, practitioners, filmmakers, artists, academics, or activists. The private and public domains of abuse and exploitation and how we as practitioners, filmmakers, artists, and scholars can address sexual violence without reenacting or sensationalizing events. As expected, this film explores the themes of graphic sexual violence. After the film has finished, we will restart this Zoom call and you will have talks by the panelists and then a Q&A session. For now, I'll hand over to Ruth to introduce the film. Thank you so much, Avni. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the SHAME team. Um, and we are very happy to be a part of the festival, a part of the Bloomsbury Festival. Um, as Avni said, I work as part of a research hub called Sexual Harms and Medical Encounters, and we seek to understand the role played by medical professionals in understanding and dealing with sexual harms. Instead of harm, we advocate for empowerment and knowledge. Thank you to the Wellcome Trust to fund our project and again to the Bloomsbury Festival to, uh, who invited us to participate in this really great series of events and welcome to our screening of The Betrayed Girls. I want to thank the director, Henry Singer, uh, for allowing us to screen the film tonight and also for being here with us afterwards to talk about it. We're also lucky enough to have historian, Dr. Sarah Marks, who will chair the panel discussion for us. Bosse Onaboye, who has extensive experience in working with young people services over many years, and also community consultant pediatrician, Dr. Deborah Hodes, who has done so much to lead the way to improve services to children and young people who have been sexually abused. So without further ado, I ask you to uh, follow the link to YouTube and we really look forward to seeing you afterwards for the talks and the Q&A. Um, welcome back everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Marks, I'm a historian at Birkbeck, and I'll be chairing um, the panel discussion and then the Q&A following that. Just um, a first point um, that I want to make to anyone um, who's here um, that may have um, experienced distress during the course of uh, watching the film, or maybe um, in the course of the, um, the panel discussion and the Q&A, we have a flyer in the chat um, which is um, a safeguarding flyer with recommendations for um, support helplines, um, if that's relevant to you. Also, because this um, Zoom call is being recorded, we need to ask your permission for that recording. And so there's also in the chat a form um, for consent for you to sign, which we would then ask you to, to send back to us. Ruth, can I just ask, is that... Um, form then to be sent back to Ria Sukhjia Singh. Is there instructions on the form? Yes, yeah, on the form. Great, thank you very much. Okay, without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel for this evening. First, Henry Singer, who um, is a acclaimed documentary filmmaker and who was the director of The Betrayed Girls. He's also the founder of Sandpaper Films Company, um, and also of interest to viewers of this film, you may have seen it already before. This is documentary Baby P, The Untold Story, which also um, has involved our um, panelist Deborah in the making. 
Secondly, Dr. Ruth Beecher um, has worked for many years in children's services, and she is also now a historian at Birkbeck University of London and is the organizer of the event tonight. Thirdly, um, Dr. Deborah Hodes is a consultant community paediatrician at University College Hospital, and she is a representative on the Children's Commissioner's inquiry into child sexual abuse. She is also the lead paediatrician at the Lighthouse. And finally, Bosse Onaboye is a director within the public sector working on children's services, leading on services for young people and community safety and wider children's commission services. Okay, and so for the first talk, um, I'm going to hand over to Henry to begin. First of all, for, for everybody who's watched the film and joined us, thank, thank you. Uh, I think on a, a cold, uh, virtually winter's night, it's a, it's a tough ask to watch The Betrayed Girl. So for all of you who've watched and are sitting in on the panel, thanks ever so much for joining us. Um, I think probably I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. I'm sure some of you will be curious as to where the idea for the film came from. Uh, the idea for the film really came from the BBC. They had commissioned a film, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen, called Three Girls, which was based on the sort of memoirs of Girl A, who's mentioned in The Betrayed Girls. And they wanted a companion nonfiction piece, a companion documentary, and they asked me uh, and my colleague uh, at the time, Jenny Saunders, what, what we felt would be a useful addition uh, to the debate. And we, we felt the, the race issue, we, we collaborated with the makers of Three Girls and there was a consensus that the race issue was an issue that wasn't, uh, wouldn't be properly addressed in the, in the drama. Uh, and, and we felt that was extraordinarily important. And of course, once we started looking into the race issue, we sort of felt there was a really strong class issue uh, as well. That cl clearly if these young girls had been uh, middle class, um, uh, the police social services, the, the liberal establishment, as Andrew Norfolk uh, describes it, uh, probably would have reacted very differently. Um, I think secondly, because this is very much what the panel is about, what the reason we're all together uh, is for, is that um, we try to portray the girls uh, in the film uh, in quite the opposite of a salacious way. Uh, uh, part of that is in the way that we film, that we, we try to, re we try to uh, make sure they were anonymous, but to retain their, their humanity. Um, and I, I hope, I, I just watched the film for the first time in three years. Um, and I, I hope we've achieved doing that in, in the way that we film them. Uh, yes, they're actors' voices. Yes, some of the girls had wigs, but we hope that we hoped, and I hope it communicates, it communicated that to the members of the audience that the way we film them, their eyes, their hands, um, you know, slow creeps up their jackets still gave people the sense of a real human being there and 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 more important I hope the film and I think this really is crucial to our discussion I the, the film provides a context at 45 minutes in you know there's a very graphic description of a, of a multiple rape of one of the young girls um, but I would hope that the film and in, in all the work that I do that that kind of graphic description serves a purpose uh, that uh, terms like child sexual exploitation and child abuse have become so common in contemporary culture, they sort of lose their meaning. And we felt it was incredibly important to include something very graphic to remind the audience what those terms mean, but that's encased in the larger context of what the film uh, was about. So uh, ideally it's, it's, it's not, it, it isn't salacious in any shape or form. It, it, it serves a larger purpose. Um, and finally, and we can get into this um, in the discussion, but there's a real duty of care around making films like this. It's not just how you portray uh, children on screen or young women on screen or young men. It's, it's also how you treat them off screen, uh, uh, you know, how you communicate when, when you first meet them, the assurances that you give them, the integrity, the integrity with which you hope you make the film and how you look after them in the aftermath of the film. Um, so I, I, I'll turn it back to Sarah now to uh, continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Um, and just to say, we're going to proceed through all of the talks and then we'll have the Q&A at the end of the talks. So Ruth, you're next up. 
Thank you so much. And thank you, Henry. Um, the Betrayed Girls demonstrates that in Rochdale, a uh, fear of appearing racist, of damaging race relations, caused authorities to avoid pursuing large numbers of men who were systematically grooming and raping young girls, vulnerable young girls. But there is actually a, a long tradition of, um, of men not being pursued who systematically abuse girls and young women and also of blaming uh, victims and survivors. Speaking as a historian, I want to take you back a little bit to 1960s London. And in 1968, a psychiatric social worker called Noel Timms published a book, this book, called Rootless in the City. And it was an evaluation of what was then a trailblazing outreach and supported lodging scheme for young vulnerable women. They were homeless young women. And he said, uh, his description was, they found difficulty in leading a stable and independent life. Now, over five years, the project worked with 38 girls. About half of them were from London. Uh, the other half were drawn to the city from all over. Um, Tim said they had disturbed early childhoods. They had seriously disrupted relationships with their parents and often long histories of abuse and being in institutional care. And he described unsettled and apparently chaotic lives. And these consisted of fitful employment, uh, uh, pregnancies, suicide attempts, uh, mental ill health, institutional care and hospital admissions. We were told that they moved Frequently, they made unsatisfactory fleeting relationships and they failed to attend appointments with services that were trying desperately to help them. And their stories left social workers feeling uh, muddled, really. They felt compassion, exasperation, anger and despair. And I think those are emotions that many of the practitioners in the audience this evening will, will identify with. In the, in the book, sexual abuse is actually only referred to once explicitly. So Anita, who's found by a project worker on a psychiatric ward in a hospital after taking an overdose, reveals that after her uh, mother died suddenly, her stepfather um, attempted familiarities, is how the project worker put it. A euphemism, but more often the sexual exploitation encountered by these girls and young women in London is coded in Tim's book through the use of a language such as uh, bad or undesirable company. So Jennifer, for example, absconded from care. Uh, she'd been separated from her sister, whom she had lived with uh, all of her life. The evaluation said that when she was found in what they considered to be bad company, she was taken before the courts and she was sentenced to borstal training because she was in need of care and protection. So she was locked up. Wendy, age 21, when the project found her, had been in and out of borstal. She'd had a baby in borstal. Uh, once in this uh, supported lodging scheme, she left the baby frequently at home. And uh, subsequently, Tim's wrote, she was found entertaining a man much older than herself who did not look a very desirable character. So this was described as the beginning of a series of visits from boyfriends to Wendy, and it led to Wendy's recall. So she was recalled back to Borstel for further, what they call training. Betty, aged 18, had spent most of her life in care, including what was then called um, a residential school for educationally subnormal children. So we would now call those children, uh, children with learning difficulties or disabilities. And project workers noted uh, that she was following the promiscuous pattern of life displayed by her mother and several older sisters. And they said that on account of her tendency to abscond and consort with men, she was committed to an approved school where she became pregnant. She then was moved to a mother and baby home up north. She left her four month old baby there and she ran away to London where she went to all night cafes and was said to be sleeping here and there with men. Although eight of these 38 young women had children or were pregnant, the circumstances of the conception and the identity of the fathers was scarcely mentioned. They just became pregnant. In the Betrayed Girls film, there's an echo of that when a journalist reporting on the Rochdale court case said there were five of them. The youngest was aged just 13 and she in fact became pregnant. In relation to the 1960s project in London, 
uh, Tim's noted that the uh, project's eminent advisors, uh, which included a psychiatrist, a medic, a social worker, um, saw the problems that faced the girls largely in terms of their own psychopathology, their individual psychopathology. Shifting to the 2000s, a CPS lawyer suggested the same when they decided not to proceed with the prosecution of two of the Rochdale perpetrators in 2009, stating, it is a tragic case that one so young has fallen into this lifestyle and has been taken advantage of in this way. In 2011, Nazir Afzal reviewed the earlier decisions by the CPS and he said in the film, when I read the prosecutor's advice to the officers in the earlier investigation, things like she has made choices about her life, you know, she has agreed to be, in effect, a prostitute for these men. Everything about it shocked me, to be blunt, because this is what groomers do. What perpetrators do is manipulate. And the fact that she was chaotic and troubled was actually the reason why she was targeted, because the perpetrator knew that nobody would believe her. Now, I lack the time this evening to talk about the pioneering work since the 1990s that was done by many large and small charities in the UK, in particular Bernardo's and the Children's Society with young runaways and what were called child prostitutes as the terminology was then. I also lack the time to talk about the ever shrinking options for young people who cannot live with their parents um, as the social safety net of benefits and support services has been withdrawn over recent decades of so-called austerity. Neither do I have time to explore the more than 20 serious case reviews that have been carried out in the last two decades that address child sexual exploitation. But I want to make a couple of points to end. Looking at the multiple serious case reviews into sexual exploitation shows us some of the differences between the 1960s and the 2000s. So whereas the single worker operating the 1960s project had not even taken a case history from the girls they worked with, services in the 2000s carefully recorded the circumstances of exploited girls and their prior experiences in family homes where they um, were physically and sexually abused, neglected, where parents uh, misused substances, for example. But taking those detailed case histories didn't mean the girls were better protected. Many of the girls whose records were examined in the various case reviews, including Rochdale, had learning disabilities. The terminology had changed. Learning disability replaced educationally subnormal, but those girls were, and still are, more likely to be victimized and less likely to be listened to. Borstal training was long gone, but girls in the 2000s were still being deprived of their liberty by the state and put into secure accommodation for, it was said, their own care and protection, while the predatory behavior of older males went unchecked. In 2018, a serious case review in Newcastle warned that we need to assume that child sexual exploitation is happening and take a proactive approach, recognizing that the most reliable source of information is from victims and those targeted. They also noticed, and this is the point that I would like to emphasize most strongly, that it is not just about specialist social workers, forensic doctors, the CPS, the police, the sexual health workers, um, and the quote continues here, the early identification of victims or potential victims or activities of perpetrators depends on alert universal services, in particular, education, health, community services, and on the vigilance and care of the public. The current national inquiry into child sexual abuse, ICSA, might encourage us all to feel reassured that things have changed or are changing. It's there to consider state and institutional failings to protect children and young people from sexual abuse and exploitation. This is right and proper. And when Sarah Rowbotham spoke to the Home Affairs Select Committee, she decried institutional failings. But her most powerful criticism was leveled at all of us. She said, it was about attitudes towards teenagers. It was absolute disrespect that vulnerable young people did not have a voice. They were overlooked. They were discriminated against. So it's not only about statutory duties and institutional procedures. States and institutions cannot be the only ones protecting children. 
we all have to respect and believe children and young people and to really listen and not back away from what they are telling us. We all have to take action. So I'm now going to hand over to Deborah Holtz, who will talk about some of the very positive changes that have taken place in the last 10 or more years in relation to child sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. Thank you very much, Ruth, for inviting me to this very important evening. And um, it's great to see that so many people have taken the opportunity to watch Henry's very moving film. I just want to mention three things that um, I've been thinking about. Well, since I started working in this field 30 years ago, I've noticed many changes, but one that is most striking is the language we use. This reflects our changed attitudes and support for survivors, and above all, ensures that fault is not located in them. Many years ago, I remember discussing the case of a young teenager who was out of control and was promiscuous. In fact, I remember writing these on my list of indicators of vulnerability. I hope such teaching slides have disappeared in my mass of folders. But it would probably be interesting to look back at my talks and document the change in the language I, as a paediatrician, have used. Strikingly in the guidelines, in our conversations, our documentation, we have reframed how we think about the exploitation and vulnerability of children and young people. And this is also happening, albeit more slowly, in the courts. I don't think it's been an easy journey and it's very difficult to change thinking and language. As we know from many other examples, changes in language encourage changes in thinking and especially when there is ambivalence. The second point I'd like to make is the important concept of contextual safeguarding developed by Carleen Furman at the University of Bedfordshire. She highlighted that social work with the child and young person needs to include their peer groups and the community spaces they inhabit at school, as well as in the traditional family unit. The change is welcome, but it is still difficult for stretch services limited by lack of funds to consider this broad context in which the young person is living, studying, playing, clubbing and working. How hard for the exploited vulnerable young person to continue living in the gang affected area, fearing seeing the abuser on their journey to school. Lastly, I want to mention one important way forward. The Lighthouse opened in 2018, following a London review that showed services for sexually abused and exploited children were seriously lacking. Sometimes children and young people were not offered a service, and when they were, they often had to repeat their story many times. Criminal justice was delayed with low conviction rates, and their physical and emotional health and well-being was not addressed or was minimal. The Lighthouse is based on the Scandinavian multi-agency model, the Barna House, and is now a three-year pilot in London. It is where the child and young person affected by sexual abuse and exploitation, many of whom have experienced complex developmental trauma, can access all the services in one place. It includes a psychology-led video recorded interview for the courts, health, advocacy, emotional well-being, and safeguarding alongside the local services. As a paediatrician, my long experience tells me that children and young people's health, both physical and sexual health, cannot be separated or addressed in isolation. Consider the physical pain resulting from emotional trauma. Unwanted pregnancy because contraception was too hard to access. The unrecognised learning disabled child who is exploited. We think the model is more joined up improves communication and offers a much better service for the children and young people and their families. We hope it'll be rolled out across the UK. So what can we do every day? For me, the most important thing is to listen to all children and young people, enable them to talk if they want about their trauma they have often kept secret and to have the opportunity to tell them that they were brave to tell, that I believe them and it was not their fault. Thank you. Now I'd like to hand over to Bosse. All right, good evening, everyone. Hopefully everyone can hear me. So I'm just going to really touch very briefly on how services have slightly moved on um, since the Rochdale inquiries. I would just like to say that I think some of it was touched on at the end of the presentation, 
that services and partnerships are moving towards more preventative models, trying to get into schools much earlier to raise awareness, to let children and young people know that their voices are heard and that they're being listened to. Partnerships are moving towards more of a disrupt model. So police and local agencies working together to disrupt rings that exploit our children and our young people. There's a wider piece of work happening across London, especially now about health and protection. How do we ensure that our most vulnerable children who are are at risk of child exploitation are protected to reduce risk and to minimize harm. Wider kind of rings are being looked at in terms of criminal exploitation too, and what is the impact? I would like to just add that there is some work that is still ongoing about how do we engage with local communities longer term. I think you saw from the film that actually there was lots happening that were, was entrenched within communities that do not necessarily always speak. So I know that agencies and partnerships across London are doing a lot of extensive work to try and engage with communities so that there are avenues for children and young people and also members of the community to speak out to engage with work that is happening across their boroughs. I will now hand back to Sarah to lead us into the Q&A. So Amy, first you have a question. Would you like to make yourself known? Yes, thank you. Um, it's for Bosse, but maybe also for other people. Um, you mentioned Bosse, um, that there's um, work going into prevention and um, talking to people before they become victims. I was just wondering, is there also work going into prevention on the perpetrator side? Um, I ask just because I, I feel like I've been brought up to make sure that I, I don't get abused. And sometimes I feel like it's, it still feels like it's on the victim then to like make sure you don't do anything that makes you vulnerable to abuse. But I guess I'm wondering, is there education happening on every, from every angle to stop people from um, feeling that they want or have to do that as well. I don't think I have a complete answer to that, but I will say that there is lots of work happening with perpetrators to disrupt their activity constantly to protect victims. So this is not putting it solely on victims to protect themselves. So I know that lots of police forces across London are doing lots of work to kind of disrupt the activity, better understand who is involved to support and protect the victims in that right, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry to push the question, but right. I, guess, I guess I'm wondering like, rather than just disrupt the disrupt is like is there education happening in in the in the areas that need to be educated to not abuse rather than just disrupting uh, like an you know I guess is there anything happening to treat it as more than a crime and also as like an issue like that needs to be do you know what I mean yes yeah, so there is work happening in schools around PSHE in terms of engaging and educating I'm going to say people who may be at risk of becoming perpetrators right. and also with local communities and working with faith groups in relation to that. So we have a couple of comments in the um, the chat um, first from Laura Eden also reiterating the fact that PSHE in schools covers consent and healthy relationships. Um, the Stop It Now campaign is focused on perpetrator education and prevention and from Marie, um, who feels that a major challenge is enabling the young people to gain insight into their position, their vulnerability, perceive the risks of their behaviours. Um, and also from Sharon um, mentioning that in her local area, there has been a publicity campaign targeting CSE aimed at the public to raise awareness. So Johanna says, isn't there a rise in talking perpetrator versus victims? And how can that be openly discussed? So I'll um, open that up to the, the whole panel, whoever would like to respond. I suppose I would start by saying that it's interesting that this is our first question, because last night we had another event here with Bloomsbury Festival about consent, uh, which some of my colleagues organised, and it was absolutely fantastic. But um, there was a, a lot of discussion there, I think, about um, why the conversation always goes back to prevention with potential victims rather than pre preventing people who are um, perpetrators or potential perpetrators. So, you know, we had a discussion about, you know, women being taught about uh, use of alcohol, etc. And, you know, 
how that sort of makes this an individual issue rather than a structural issue in society. And I think the same goes for um, child sexual exploitation and child sexual abuse generally. And while the pants campaign that the NSPCC run is an absolutely brilliant campaign, it, it also infuriates me that 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 is where we have to put our resources into teaching children. Um, and I suppose it also really discourages practitioners and the general public now from getting involved in children's lives and um, from talking to children. And there's a fear about talking to children and um, you know what they will say and uh, wh what the implications of that are if they do disclose harm of any form, but particularly sexual abuse. Um, I think there's also, um, as we've seen, it, you know, more and more strongly in the research is that um, what we now call harmful sexual behavior, where the perpetrator or it, it is a child who is sexually harming another child. Some of the research, you know, is looking at up to a third of sexual abuse being um, perpetrated by a young person. I know Eileen Vizard has done an awful lot of work on this over the decades and has written a lot of really good stuff about it. But I think that is something that, you know, unless you're involved in a child sexual exploitation team or in sexual health work or that a lot of practitioners find very, very difficult to deal with. The people who deal with it extremely well and are so underrated and, and, and rarely praised for their work are actually people who work in early years education and childcare where they, they, do they do see some of the results of this behavior with kind of sexualized behavior and they deal with it brilliantly. This is something that we need to be able to talk about. And I think, you know, I mentioned ICSA in my talk and one of my slight frustrations about ICSA is I've interviewed a lot of health practitioners for my research, which is actually about child sexual abuse in the family. And the kind of message is like, well, you know, we've got ICSA now and we've got the Truth Project and people are speaking up and that is true. But I think that the downside of really putting a lot of resources into investigating institutional abuse is that um, the abuse that happens in the family and happens with the close network and the neighbours and, you know, mum's new partner or, or cousin or whoever it is, is, is not really talked about at all. And um, I've got colleagues on, the, on this call from Islington. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've had that discussion about how it's almost like big organizations struggle to deal with more than one major policy issue at a time. So um, all the training rolls out about child sexual exploitation. And so I'm very much oversimplifying. But I think, you know, how do we engage people at very early stages in having conversations? Because we don't have to talk to children about child sexual abuse. We just have to be confident about talking to children in general and that it's not just a job for their parents and it's not just a job for a social worker or a teacher. Karen has a question to everyone. Hi. Um, my question is, I, I, having grown up in the north of England uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, and having per personally witnessed how young girls can be sexually objectified um, long before the Rochdale and, and, and the questions of immigration and all that, that was about is now a worry for me certainly having worked in education and now in preventative services is that children that are homeschooled it doesn't seem to be regulated as I thought it was before I came across and experienced children that are taken out of education and are homeschooled and are these children at, at risk of falling through for want of a better word the safeguarding safety net that we have because there isn't the education around them it's whether their parents take them to the GP who is safeguarding these children because they are basically out of education and and being homeschooled and it, and it isn't really regulated the way that it should be as Ruth mentions there's actually also quite a lot of practitioners in the audience so I wonder whether um because we're, we're having some comments around um the usefulness of particular models and um, people's experiences. And actually maybe it does make sense, Ruth, um, if we wanted to open up for comments um, in response to the discussion, as well as just questions to the panel at this point. Um, so if you'd like to do that, do you want to 
mention in the chat um, that you'd like to make a comment as well. Thanks. I mean, I'm happy to, I, I'm not, I, I have never worked in education, worked alongside education colleagues. Um, uh, and I suppose that, you know, what I would say is there is regulation and I imagine that that varies in terms of its administration from authority to authority. And I suppose what we would add is that uh, the levels of um, elective home education have risen quite dramatically because of COVID. And that um, does increase the concern around um, the safety and, and the welfare of children um, in general, um, because, you know, we've got children being sent home in their, when their bubbles burst, if you like, in school when somebody is uh, diagnosed with COVID. So we have much less visibility around children in general. So I, I think you know, I, I, although I don't know the area well, I would say that you are right to to raise it as a concern, and I would say that there is regulation, but you know that varies from local authority to local authority. But there are people in the audience who are much better placed to answer that question than me. Just to read out some of the responses that we've had, um, Karen, I'm actually not sure um, who this is addressed to specifically. Um, you mentioned that you'd be interested in having more discussion. Um, and or an understanding of the difficulties faced by practitioners. Um, as a practitioner who's used the pant Pantasaurus and parent with parent and carers, um, you believe that you're more than willing to have those discussions with the people that you work with. Um, and Sharon mentions that she agrees that homeschool school children should be registered. An annual educational inspection once a year is not sufficient. Laura mentions that the law is too weak around home education in her view and um, lobbying government to ensure that vulnerable children should not be home educated. And Celia says that sexual abuse and harmful sexual behaviour displayed by adolescents is a very different challenge than structure of work to working with adult perpetrators of sexual exploitation of children. Um, and yes, so Karen was responding to Ruth earlier. Deborah? Yes, I, th I think um, one thing that we're sort of touching on now is about the responsibility and the sense of blame. And I do think it's important. And one of the problems is, is, is finding good um, support literature and ways of framing this. And I do think one of the problems about the Pantasaurus, as good as it might be, is it does put the onus on the child. It's their responsibility when it actually isn't their responsibility. And it's also about them being the passive victim, if you like, rather than sometimes they're asked to participate in acts. And that isn't addressed in that um, prevention leaflet, which is a very big area that needs attention, I think. And then going older in the teenage years, there, there is more literature and support. But I think somewhere in middle childhood, there needs to be some more help for all of us practitioners to help children understand about what might be going on. Thanks, Deborah. Ria has a question. Great, thanks. And I, I should probably make the disclaimer that um, I work with uh, Ruth, so I'm taking advantage of, of being an insider here. Um, so I, I have a question going back to um, the film in Rochdale, um, because I, I'm not from here, so I wasn't familiar with this before. Um, so one of the things that struck me a little bit in it was the narrative around like race and race relations and religion and multicultural Britain being a really thorny issue in which you have the far right and the BNP using this abuse of young girls to foment racial discord. And on the other hand, I'm um, you apparently have people who are like so racially sensitive and so sensitive to race relations that they couldn't possibly act on this. Um, and I apologize because I think my tone is a little bit, um, a little bit flippant there, but I, I, there was something there that didn't quite sit well with me. And I, I suppose I'm willing to believe that the people who were slow to act were well-intentioned, but I, it seems to me like it created the scenario where just if it hadn't been, um, if it hadn't been an issue of race and religion, if it hadn't been Muslim men, then surely there would have been a robust response and, you know, robust action and these men would have been brought to justice. And it felt a little bit to me like, you know, is there a kind of, 
I mean, sort of, we know that's not the case. You don't really need a reason to disbelieve women and girls. You don't need a reason to not bring charges against perpetrators. You don't really need a reason to not find those perpetrators guilty. So I just wondered if there, if there was any sense that where this scandal presented an opportunity for the far right to um, uh, advance their agenda. And as it was noted in the film, you know, they sort of use this, but didn't use anything to help these girls. Was there any element of the issue of race and religion being used as, um, you know, a kind of handy reason to not take action? Um, and and I know that's slightly uncomfortable, but I just thought it creates a situation where we're meant to believe that if it hadn't been for this very fraught issue, then you know there wouldn't have been a problem at all. And I I think we sort of know from the way sexual violence against adult women and and girls works that 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 that's not really the case. And a lot of a lot of the stuff that came out of the court material seems to echo actually just any other case, right? Like disbelief of victims, um, the idea that you're not credible enough, that it would be thrown out. Um, and so I just, yeah, I wondered if anyone had had any views on that. Um, I think that's a really interesting question if I, if I follow you. And, and, you know, as a, I'm not an expert uh, on this panel, nor in the audience, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm one of these people that chooses subjects and looks at them I hope really closely and conscientiously and thoroughly and, and, you know, not necessarily comes to conclusions, but I hope provokes questions in an audience that watches it. Uh, you know, I think you're right. Uh, uh, you know, would these men have, would there have been action if these men hadn't been of Pakistani origin? And I get, I, I, and this is simplistic and I've mentioned it earlier. So I would welcome not just the panel, but the audience to get involved in this answer. I mean, I, I I certainly think that the class issue, um, you know, was as strong, and, and it's not it's not explicit in the film. Uh, I mean, I hope it's implicit. Um, Sarah Robotham, at the end, sort of touches on it on, in that very impassioned uh, final answer she gives to the uh, select committee about the, these children's voices just weren't listened to. Um, and I think, I think what she's really articulating, but not explicitly, is the class issue. And I think Sara um, sort of identifies. I think one of the reasons she's so extraordinary in, in, in her work and in the work that she did and kept sort of hammering home and working so hard and went through real trauma across those years trying to get authorities to listen is that she really identified uh, with those girls, if you, if you know something about her background. So I think class is a huge issue in this. And I, and I find myself asking it again, this is an answer for the panelists or a question for the panelists and for the audience, because you're all more expert than I am. And if those girls had been uh, middle-class daughters of uh, lawyers and, uh, you know, surgeons and, you know, you know, columnists from the times, et cetera, would the authorities have been, would, would they have acted? And, and I, sus I suspect they would have. Uh, but again, and so I'd, I'd love to open that up to other people to, to, to respond to Ria's, you know, really interesting question. And actually just following on immediately from that, um, McMora in the chat asks if she can comment or he can comment on this. So please do go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a he actually. <laughs> um, uh, just to touch on the race issue, and um, um, I was involved, from a health perspective, in, in some of the early investigations around um, the Derby case, and then later I had different types of involvement because of the work I was doing with Rotherham. Um, but uh, I think what, you know, in 2020, I think we have to look back at where we were in 2009, and um, we were still in a, a post 9-11 situation where um, there was a lot in some of these cities there was a lot of sensitivity around um, um, Pakistani Muslim communities and a lot of sensitivity in those communities so I think there was a lot of um, concern not to be seen to focus on them because of other issues this is for Ria really in particular that the 
the issue of, of, of a community that already felt picked on were very sensitive to the focus being on this. But I think what you've really pointed out, and it is true, is from, from my rather long experience, I don't think that the um, outcome was any different than any of the cases. I can say that at the same time as what, you know, Operation Retriever in Derby, we had two other live cases involving um, vulnerable young women and um, white men largely. And those cases just never drew any media attention. But um, the outcomes were no better for them. And I, I, I always felt, and I'm glad you, Henry, brought that up, is that I always felt that uh, class was fundamentally the issue here, and perhaps even to an extent class in the context of perpetrators. That actually, you know, far from them being reluctant to go after them, it may have been easier to go after them in the long run. Um, but uh, but it was the, the culture issue was more about community cohesion than it was about the race issue in itself. Okay, um, Amy, would you like to comment? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm sort of not sure if this is helpful to add, but um. I, I come from Ireland and um, we've obviously had huge issues with sexual abuse in the Catholic Church um, um, with priests and things. And it's, it's something that we as a community had to like acknowledge wasn't um, it wasn't just like by chance that lots of men who happened to become priests happened to then abuse children and that it was, in fact, um, to do with the the celibacy that was expected of them and the various rules relating to our religion and relating to being a priest within our religion and so I guess I just wanted to say that I think that all of it all of it can be true I think it's very much a class issue for the victims I think it's true what Raya says that um, women historically and currently just aren't believed easily and um, it's it's an issue just no matter who the victim is but I, I think it's important not to um, brush to one side um, the cultural significance as well, just because certainly in Ireland, we've had to acknowledge that it wasn't like, whoops, how come all these priests are doing this? It was actually quite related to the rules and, and culture of the Catholic Church at the time when a lot of the priests had gone into the, and been ordained. So. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the fact that I think all of those things can be true. Thank you. Um, going further back up the chat, um, Sarah um, asks, um, she wonders if at a larger level any of the other countries were having any effect on the prevention of child sexual exploitation, um, knowing that perhaps Denmark chose to question, question how um, I think that should be cases were reported back to language and its impact and prisons have closed. Tabloid reporting of crime and depictions of adolescent women is something that maybe that maybe society could challenge and the virtual disembodied world of online porn can't be helping with prevention either. Does anyone on the panel, first of all, want to respond? Having tried to plow my, my way through the statistics on child sexual abuse and exploitation over the last 18 months or so, that it's a really difficult question to answer. So. In the US, um, uh, David Finkelhor, a sociologist who's probably the most well-known and well-respected over decades um, person to write about um, sexual abuse from a, a variety of different perspectives, but including the statistics, um, has argued quite strongly that um, the prevalence of child sexual abuse, the actual prevalence, has reduced in the United States. And... Um, you know, he, he looks at lots of different data sets to say that. He looks at, you know, the adults uh, who are self-reporting, if you like, looking back at their childhood, which is, you know, gives much higher numbers than uh, reported to the police and prosecuted uh, sexual crimes against children. Our statistics in this country, and there are, again, people on the call who are, know much more about this than me, and I'm hoping would, would perhaps chip in, but they're they're appalling, really. It says something, doesn't it, about how much this country wants to make change, structural change, that we don't actually have a decent set of statistics about child sexual abuse, either in the family or exploitation of children, and young people. 
Um, we don't have any large scale survey like they do and have had in the US for many years. So there has not been that investment in, 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 in recording things and in measuring what's happening. So it is very, very difficult to say. I'm afraid I don't know much about Scandinavia in terms of the statistics. I don't know whether, Deborah, you do know a bit more because of the, the Barna House model, et cetera, but I certainly, I don't know. I know that the statistic most quoted here in the UK still for many years is of, qu of quite now, uh, I think 2009 NSPC study, which uh, estimates that only one in 20 uh, cases of sexual abuse is reported. I want to go to Celia's question from earlier. Um, she asked, since making the film and follow-up conversations, have the people involved seen any positive change in the CPS response to sexual abuse and child exp sexual exploitation cases? Yeah, I mean, I think, Maggie Oliver's in the film. You'll you'll remember her as the, the sort of incredibly courageous policewoman who has enormous uh, integrity. Um, and you know, she 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 talks about Operation Augusta uh, early in the film and her incredible distress at having uncovered the systematic, you know, child sexual exploitation that was going on, and then having that report uh, shelved. Uh, essentially, uh, and her great discouragement, um, well, discouragement is an understatement. She, she was so upset, she remains, she remains upset, and she remains sort of an extraordinary um, activist on behalf of uh, women who were abused as, as children. Um, it, it's, people often think that uh, films don't make a difference. Uh, and, and one thing that grew out of the film, this is sort of a lateral way of answering, is that um, the mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, who's been in the news recently, watched the film and on the next day um, announced a review of Operation Augusta. Um, and I, I haven't revisited the report that came out, but it, it, it found Greater Manchester Police very much deficient. Uh, um, and I think Greater Manchester Police has, and as Nazir says at the end of the film, they, you know, they, they they were very they were humi they've been since humi humiliated by Operation Augusta. Um, the Rochdale case in and of itself was very unimpressive on by them, and they've tightened up things extraordinarily. But I think you know Maggie has started a foundation. She remains very much in touch with the women that we interviewed in the film. Um, but I, and again, this is really to. Deborah and others on the panel. I, at least in Rochdale, I think it's very much a kind of piecemeal uh, thing uh, when you get down to it. Uh, and it's and it's the it's the efforts of people like Maggie, who took it upon who took it upon herself to look after this set of girls and has taken it upon herself to start a foundation on behalf of uh, girls and women like the ones portrayed in in the film. Whether, whether there's and whether the Greater Manchester Police's reforms. And in a sense, the exposure of Operation Augusta has really led uh, to systemic change. Um, I don't really know. Uh, and whether that kind of systemic change takes time to trickle down, uh, you know, on the street, for lack of a better term, I'm not, I'm not entirely aware of. Okay, we have a question from Lauren Cantillon or Cantillon. Um, as practitioners, researchers, and creatives working in the field. How do you protect yourself from the emotional burnout when working directly with victim survivors and their recounting of sexual abuses? Do you actively try to harness your personal emotional responses to this material or not, or somewhere in between? So I, I think that's a question for Bosse and for Deborah and for Ruth also, if you're, and actually it applies to you, Henry, as well. I mean, the. Um, the work that you do looks very closely um, at very difficult testimony. So I think um, this applies to everybody on the panel for sure. People are sort of surprised because I, all of my films sort of look at very, very dark subjects. I'm, I'm, I'm most known for a film called The Falling Man, which is about people that are a particular person that jumped off the World Trade Center on 9-11. And uh, I, I made a film on Baby P over two years I think when you make a film, at least for, for me, those testimonies, they serve a larger purpose and it's, it's public service. Uh, I think it must be something, it, sort of what a war, war photographer does. You, you have your 
focus so much on the eye, your eyes on the prize. And the prize in my case is trying to make a, a piece of work that really is a public service and does some good that I don't, I don't, I don't find those testimonies actually affect me emotionally. And that maybe sounds, makes me sound rather cold. Um, they do later. My, the first film I ever made was about the role of medicine in dying people. And I filmed extraordinarily intimate moments where people made decisions to withdraw life support, et cetera. And I remember the very first film I made as a young man, I filmed that kind of a, a moment and the cameraman pulled the eyepiece away and he had tears in his eyes. My assistant producer, who I'd never seen emotional, sort of grabbed me in the hall afterwards and started uh, crying. And I just was saying to myself, God, I hope the cameraman got the cutaways. I hope he got the cutaways. The cutaways being a technical term of different images that you can cut away to during the sequence. And it wasn't until a year later when I watched the film that I felt incredibly moved by it. So I think for me, those kinds of incredibly intimate and painful testimonies, like the one I spoke to in my introduction, that horrific graphic description of the sort of razor blade moment for that young woman, they serve a higher calling. And when you're making a film, uh, it is about that higher calling. It's about trying to do meaningful and worthwhile work that'll cut through to the audience and make them really think about things. Other members of the panel like to respond? Um, I, I don't mind going um, next, Sarah. So I, I wouldn't say that it ever gets any easier. I think listening to some of the accounts of some of the children and young people that work, um, that are in our services and the workers that are having to experience it, it doesn't get easier. I think in a just really kind of human way, it's about making sure that we get the right support. So some of us, and I know for myself personally, especially right at the beginning of my practitioner years, I spent time making sure that I was getting counselling and therapy for myself um, because we can't go away and pretend that we're not impacted by the things that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, lots and lots of support goes in at work as well to make sure that there are kind of clinical kind of supervision models to support and to enable us to, to deal with some of the trauma or vicarious trauma that we're experiencing listening to the accounts that, that we have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, I recommend if you don't have the chat open, there's a lot of very good discussion in the chat, which is kind of too long for me now um, to read out. Um, thank you, Bosse, for your response. Um, I actually have a question um, uh, to the panel potentially. Um, and possibly also to some of the um, members of the audience. Um, I remember the first time I watched the film, um, the, there's a moment where a pin is put into the map and it's my hometown, Derby. Um, and it reminded me, you know, in the way that you kind of push knowledge that you sort of don't want to know about out of your awareness sometimes. It reminded me of um, the fact that we knew there were certain many cab companies that you didn't go to um, when I was a teenager, um, when, when we were get, going home from clubbing at night, and, and we knew why you didn't go to them. Um, and that would have been late 90s to early, so, so around kind of late 90s to 2000, 2001. Um, and I was wondering um, whether the, the extent to which we know how far back um, some of these networks um, and uh, crimes were happening um, because it, there's a, a degree to which it, it came to the fore um, in the 2000s, um, but is, is there a kind of a backstory and a suspicion that this may have been going on for much longer um, than the, the particular cases that um, we, we have the evidence for? I'm, I'm sure it goes on longer. In the film, if you'll remember, Andrew Norfolk, uh, an extraordinary journalist for the Times who sort of broke the story, he mentions, and I forget in which community, and maybe he doesn't identify the community, but he talks about uh, fathers and sons, um, you know, that the sons were perpetrating crimes to the daughters of the fathers who perpetrated, perpetrated these crimes uh, to the mothers. Uh, and certainly when we were researching the film, you got the sense that um, the, the story breaking in the in the knots, if that's the right term, uh, 
de definitely ha ha had a had a history. And, and again, we did, we didn't explore it in the film, but I think Andrew's piece of sync or his his soundbite, um, you know, sort of tells you that, doesn't it? When child sexual abuse was sort of rediscovered in the UK um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there was a very early uh, article in the British Medical Journal by someone writing about sex rings in Leeds, which later did a lot of, they did, the Leeds sexual abuse team later did a lot of really good work. It, uh, and I think what historians have shown is there's a sort of a cyclical pattern, isn't there, in terms of when society recognizes sexual abuse uh, as a social construct. And, you know, so these things go on all the time, but we only sometimes name them and respond to them. And I think generally that happens when feminism is strong um, and various historians, Linda Gordon is one in the States, have looked at uh, that sort of cycle and uh, how uh, feminism comes to the fore and those women, you know, articulate, you know, uh, in the early 20th century to raise the age of consent, etc. I suppose the difficulty is that when you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, you're looking at a child being considered in a very different way, as well as the fact that there isn't a concept of sexual abuse per se. I think these things, you know, do come round and, and are named periodically. And that's one of the really interesting things is why this point in time we are all naming institutional abuse and abuse by footballers and abuse by rap stars and abuse by the Catholic Church and not necessarily by fathers, brothers, cousins, your sister's friend, etc. So I suppose that's what interests me about it. Okay, we're now at 9.25, so unless there are any, one final burning question, um, I don't see any further in the chat, then I'll pass back to Ruth, um, and also to thank um, everybody on the panel for your um, responses and to the audience for your questions and comments. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for your um, great ability to keep us all in check and facilitate what has been such a, a, an amazing discussion. Uh, and I want to thank the panel, Deborah, Henry, Bosse. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Ria, who spoke earlier, um, who has been amazing in helping us uh, organize this event, as in everything we do. She's our public engagement uh, lead person. And um, she's amazing. And also the festival and AFNI in particular. It's been great to, to be a part of this and for the Shame Project to um, get involved. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit the Shame website. It's just shame.bbk for birkbeck.ac.uk. And you can sign up to our mailing list there. But there's also lots of information about other members of the team, our research and various events. And if you sign up, you'll hear about other things that are happening, which will be very exciting. I can tell you that in the years to come. Um, I just wanted to, to leave um, by saying that um, something, just repeating what I've said earlier, that the abuse of many children and young people has become even more invisible than usual during COVID. And so I feel like we, we can all make a difference. And I suppose um, that's where I step out of the dispassionate historian mode and into the um, passionate advocate for children and young people. And I suppose just ask people to take that back. I think most, many people here already have that as part of their uh, everyday lives. So thank you so much for a brilliant evening and so some great comments and questions and good night to everybody.